So, uh, Barry, I understand you were the leader on uh, set. Oh, I don't, I don't know about that. I, I, I think that we all knew that we'd have to do our homework before we showed up because Clint would just leave you in the dust yeah. if you didn't, and there was no formal boot camp or rehearsal, yeah, and so we kind of just ended up becoming our characters. They would call me Sarge, and I'd call him Iggy, and yeah, we'd call Ryan Philippe Doc, and we all took on those roles. If they needed help with their weapons, I'd be there. If, if we needed a bandage, we'd go to Doc. So it just worked that way. It wasn't conscious decision. Were you surprised, though, that uh, in a war movie that there was no boot camp? No, we we knew that that was a conscious. Decision. Yeah, I think you know if Clint wanted that effect of uh, guys heading to somewhere where they had no idea what they were about to face. You know, and I think that that wide-eyed effect of people being completely out of their depth is something that those Marines went through and, uh, and something that Clint definitely wanted to make sure he captured with his method of, of directing, yeah. especially with the younger kind of actors, yeah. uh, me included and Joseph Cross and some of the other actors who don't have that much experience, you know, yeah. coming in on a big movie with Clint opposite you is sometimes quite daunting and yeah. I think it worked to good effect. I know, because I just saw him down the hall and you just get that effect like it's freaking Ooh. Clint Eastwood, yeah. you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And I'm thinking, though, know, as actors going for a role, I don't know if you or how you approach or audition mm -hmm. for this role, but is it like almost a no-brainer, though, when you're dealing with not only Clint, but, uh, you know, Paul writing the... In terms of the role of, you take? I've actually, yeah. like, I've got to do this, or yeah. there's, like, there's absolutely no worry. You know, like, you do a project. Yeah, yeah. like, yeah. I'll play a canteen. I, I'll do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, I think it, each of us felt that way. We would take anything he was willing to throw our way. And, but, yeah, you get there and you realize there's a massive amount of work to be done, and that if you don't keep up, you'll just be left in the dust, because he's a machine on and off at the set. He works in a really, like Spielberg, he works in a really fluid and organic style doesn't want to rehearse, doesn't want to talk about it too much. His motto is, uh, or the leastest is the, the leastest is the bestest yeah, or something I think like so. that. <laughs> and uh, he, he'll say things like, we've come this far, let's not ruin it by thinking. <laughs> you know, and you're like, okay, let's get on with it. And it was just a wonderful way to work, so. Well, you guys have done your share of, of projects and worked with your share of directors, but how was it adjusting to the let's do this in one take if we can type of situation? We've worked on other films like that, but this was just consistent for like three months, you know, mm. no rehearsal, one take, mm. and um, I liked it. I mean, I, I actually kind of thrived on it. it. It made you feel like you were moving forward, you were in the moment. There wasn't a lot of sitting around, long 16-hour days of endless uh, nothing. Yeah, it's like you said before, like a lot of actors will always be narcissistic and ask for like one more, you know, like just give me one more, just give me one more, and Clinton is just, you know, he's like, no, you know, we, we got what we came here to do, let's just go forward, you know, yeah. it's all about going forward. You talked about being in the moment. I was really surprised to find out that they didn't tell you where all the explosions were going to happen. Isn't that a little It's not that they wouldn't wow. tell us, it's, it's just 90% like... of the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that obviously added to something when you're... Uh, yeah, it did, you're... it did. I mean, nobody got really, I mean, I had one squib blow up in my face one day and caught my lip and and uh but clint just said yeah it's a long way from your heart <laughs> keep going you know this kind of thing right and uh so i got my stitches after work and we kept filming you know and he was just you you just he just had so much confidence in his ability and your ability that it just it it, it infected everyone i mean everyone was just yeah, yeah, let's yeah. go for it we don't need another take moving forward yeah now, we, we saw what uh, happened with your demise in the film mm -hmm. and uh, Iggy's demise we didn't see and they hinted to it. And I was wondering, do they actually shoot something that maybe they cut or was there just a... No, I mean, it's, a, it's a pretty <coughs> touchy subject that the whole mystery behind Iggy's uh, uh, end is, is kind of interesting. And I spoke to James Bradley about it, the guy who wrote the book and stuff, mm -hmm. and it was, it's a touchy subject to bring up with him, you know, because it was obviously something that affected his father in such a, a deep way. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the way Clint visualizes it, he just he, he sets up my character as such a kind of happy-go-lucky bicycle kid with incredible over-enthusiasm for the war. And then he just leaves you with your own kind of devices as to what actually happened to him. I think that's it's the most respectful way of doing it. You know, and he, he also had, chose to have confidence in Ryan Philippe's reaction alone, yeah. just that you see on Doc's face yeah. what he's seeing, mm. and, and um, that's all you really need. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, Roger. Thanks.